I'm Jane Morrell, founder and CEO of Kera Solutions. It is my pleasure to welcome you all here today to the very first episode of Chatability. We created Chatability to provide a platform for our community to engage in meaningful conversations about topics that are important to people living with disability. Today is our pilot episode, which gives us the opportunity to start this two-way conversation and explore the ways we can take this show on the road and get as many people as we can connecting and sharing their experiences. Before we start today, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land upon which we work and the meeting on today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I'd also like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. The topic we will be exploring today with our amazing panel of guests is disability inclusion. Disability inclusion is central to equality and ensures that each person is given the same opportunities to achieve the same outcomes as everyone else. It ensures people with disability are included and by doing so, it also enriches our society. Today, I'm excited to explore with our panel what disability inclusion looks and feels like for them across various social, educational and employment settings. I'd like to welcome our first guest, Dina Basile, who is the founder of Tibi Access, a consultancy which has been created to change the landscape of live music events by making gigs accessible to people of all abilities. Next, we have Kez Glenane, who is an ambassador for Down Syndrome Australia. Kez is passionate about being able to provide a voice for her community. As a Down Syndrome Australia ambassador, she says she would like to help people with Down Syndrome to get a paid job in the community and live independently. Our next guest is Serene Tan from Gymnastics Victoria. Serene is also a carer for her autistic brother. Her background as a former gymnast and coach means she understands the benefits gymnastics can have for people with disability and the importance of creating an inclusive environment in mainstream sports settings. And last but certainly not least, I'd like to introduce you to Storm Robbins. Storm has cerebral palsy and is on a mission to change people's attitudes and perceptions of what having a disability looks and feels like. He is passionate about helping people realise that a person with disability should not be treated differently from anyone else. Awesome. So welcome, everybody. Um, first question to yourself, Dina. Now, you created Tibby uh, with a mission to open up gigs. To, to, and events to everyone. How far do you think we, ca we have come in making the world more inclusive and how far do you think we still have to go? It's a, um, a loaded question, <laughs> that one. Um, I think over the last sort of 12 to 24 months, um, we've seen a big shift change in people's attitudes, more organisations, individuals, people want to learn about accessibility and disability, mm -hmm. they want to open their doors to a wider audience that isn't always welcome. Um, and not yep. intentionally, but um, it's, it's been a, a good shift change. And I never thought I'd say the good thing about COVID, um, but the good thing about COVID is that because we were in lockdown with nothing else to do, people were taking on training. You know, we provide uh, disability awareness training and accessibility training within the live music industries. And, and we had, you know, people obviously with the entertainment industry suffering so much and, and not being able to host shows, it gave them the opportunity to then go, this is what we need to improve on and we mm. actually have time to improve on it. So during that time, we had a lot of people coming through doing that training and, and upskilling um, within accessibility and disability. And the important thing is that the conversation has actually started and it's happening now. We still have a long way to go. There's still mm. change that needs to be happened, but it's the, it's the first steps of having these conversations, sitting on panels like these, you know, engaging with different people and telling our stories, which is the important part. Yeah, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. So what do you think there are some initiatives from the community that um, could encourage this conversation to continue? What are your thoughts around that? Um, I think I think it's about reaching out to people with lived experience because yeah. we are the ones that are living it, experiencing it every day. Have those conversations with your community, do your research, reach out to organisations like mine, like Get Skilled Access, like different organisations that are out there to provide support 
and sort of guide you. You don't know what you don't know, right? But you yeah. have to start somewhere. Yeah. So. And Tibby held a, an event earlier this year. Tell us a little yeah. bit about that. Yeah. So, um, we held our first inclusive and accessible music festival awesome. um, and it was called Groove Tunes and it was at the Corner Hotel um, and we yep. had a stage where musicians with disability were able to perform um, and, and bring their most authentic selves to the stage and feel supported um, by us and then obviously having a space that was accessible and inclusive to, to everyone and it was an all abilities festival. It was one of the best nights um, yeah, that will, will stick with me forever and we want to make it annual which is really great. Excellent, yeah. excellent. And I think that's a, just such a clear indication of community support, like yeah. getting someone, an organisation like the Corner Hotel to get involved and yeah. really open their doors and embrace yeah. it, which yeah. is the amazing. Corner, yeah. The Corner were wonderful and um, you know we wanted to make it and all abilities for everyone to come to have a safe space yeah. and um, also showcase to venues um, and music industry people that this is what an accessible festival looks like. This is what every single show should look like moving yeah. forward. Yeah. Um, and it was, yeah, it was really good. Brilliant. Great. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Yeah. Any questions from anybody in the audience regarding Tibby and Dina's experiences? Hi, I'm Natalie from uh, the Cerebral Palsy Support Network. You mentioned that COVID had been an asset in making this happen. Oh. I'm just wondering how you felt about uh, the current shift in providing online resources and everything else like telehealth and, and events such as these, do you think there'll be a shift to making this a more permanent arrangement after COVID settles and as we continue to quote unquote return back to normal? Mm -hmm. I hope so. Um, I think providing both online and in person is really important because for people with lived experience and disability, sometimes, you know, for example, if a venue is an accessible where a band that I want to go and see, if it's not accessible, I, if it's being streamed, I can still participate and I can still enjoy it. Um, and it gives us sort of that flexibility where if we're run down, if a chronic illness is coming, you know, if we've got a flare up of a chronic illness, whatever it is, there's still that option for us to participate, but participate a little bit differently. Great, thanks cool. Dina. Thank you. Kez, we've got a question for you today. Um, and that is, why is disability inclusion so important to you? Disability inclusion is important to me because I believe everyone has the right to be treated the same. It means to make me and everyone feel welcome. Inclusion means getting to know me by talking so I can understand. Team at Harris Gaff inclusion means showing me how I know what job to do and how to do it. When I work at Harris Gaff I can earn money to live on in my future. Um, working makes me feel included in the community. I want more say and control in my life. Being included means being able to make my own decisions and having my own power in my life. I like to be able to go shopping. I like someone to help me with new interests. I like having a relationship with my boyfriend. Sometimes in the future, I would like to maybe get married. Inclusion means being able to do all these things, even with disability. Great, great. And you've had a great career at Harris Scarf, working there for the past um, nine years. Now, what does this mean for you, Kez? 
Well, um, in health gaff, I um, in nine years have a really good team. Um, I have a really good boss named Wayma, um, and they made me feel like I'm part of the staff and making me feel like I'm there to, because they made me feel like I'm welcome. Um, some of my friends from work, they say that it's good to have a person with disability like me to be part of Howard Scarf and the team, to be friends with and to have some fun with. And just also just, you know, not like just fun, you know, just at work, because you're there to work. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, um, but when you, um, doing other things outside of work, you still have fun with your own friends. But with work, they have to have a certain rules that, that um, my friends have to be, be extra work really, really hard and make sure that the office, for the head office from House Gaff, to know they're doing the right thing. Does anyone in the audience have any questions for Kez regarding her experience with inclusion? Or you guys? Or I've anyone got else one on the question. Panel? Yeah, absolutely. What's your message, Kez, to future em employees or employers that want to work with people with disabilities who are, who are interested? Well, you can get support with disabilities, with people who want to work in retail. Um, some people in disabilities don't always get retail like other people can because they've got low self-esteem in their own head. Um, but they can also, if they need any help, they have people like from House Garth, for example, if I was there and they don't know what, I, what support I've got, I ask my boss and have support for them, so yeah. Very well said. I just think it's great that you've got such a good um, job at Harris Scarf, that's wonderful. What could Harris Scarf have done better um, to um, support you in your job role and what have they done well? I think they did really well supporting me. Um, they um, support me to encourage me to make sure that I get experience to learn about customer service um, and how to um, look at them to, to know what they, what they need help with. Like if they need help with shoes, um, they ask they come up to me and they ask me if um, they need help. But I would say if they want people from a house gas to make me feel better, I think to show me what's better, what um, the shoes sizes are. Um, but because I'm not good at the sizes like other people can. So yeah, but um, they know what size they have, but it doesn't really matter what they do because they, they're perfect. They don't need anything else. <laughs> Move on to question three, and this is for Serene. Um, why do you think it is important to embed disability awareness, acceptance and inclusion into education, sport and workplace settings? Yep. So I believe that it's just not awareness that needs to be embedded in more mainstream settings, um, but inclusion as well. So these are the places that people go every day, like the grocery store, people go to work every day and people go to school. And these are the type of experiences that almost everyone needs in their life. So it's really important that these mainstream places not only are aware of the different types of needs and abilities that people have, but they are accepting and that they know how they can use their um, skills and their knowledge to meet the needs of other people and 
really learn from people with lived experience with a disability how they can better meet their needs and remove the barriers to accessibility and create more experience for people with disabilities and give them just yeah better access to these mainstream settings. Yeah, absolutely. Anyone on the panel had any experiences where they think they've, um, you know, been in a setting where they've done it exceptionally well? I think it, I think it comes down to customer service. Yeah. You know, when people are willing to take time and, and support us as people, not, mm. not, you know, a person with a disability, but yep. just a person and take time to listen to us, to understand us. Um, it, it shows, mm. it, it shows. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Do you think, I mean, I sort of, is, are you sensing that that's getting better or yeah. are we moving the needle on that? Is that going forward or do you think it's just kind of, it's been the way it has been for such a long time? I, th I think it's moving forward. Yeah. I think, again, it comes down to people just being more aware yeah. um, and, yeah. and wanting to change and yeah. wanting to upskill their businesses and their organisations yeah. to be aware of, you know, not just people with disability, but people in other community groups mm. as well and, and being more inclusive as a whole. Correct, yeah. yeah, and there's a massive piece there, isn't there, on education, like making yeah. sure that we're educating our communities. It's all right to say, you know, we deal, we work in the disability sector, but what do people know about mm. that? We have to actively make them yeah. um, aware and bring them across all the information that they need to create those spaces for people. Yep, yeah. awesome. Anybody else in the audience got a question? Um, Serene, in the introduction, um, it, uh, Jane mentioned that you have a brother with autism. Yeah. And I wondered if you wanted to maybe share with us some of your observations on his lived experience of in being included. Yep, yep. So um, I've been caring for my brother now for 20 years. So um, he has quite a high level of needs. Um, he often has trouble transitioning and um, he has to use different methods of communication. So a lot of the time when we have had tried to bring him out to places, we generally have specific places where we know we can bring him because we have experience knowing that this place um, kind of has more education or more experience working with people with disabilities. Um, a lot of the times we have unfortunately been turned away, been told that his needs are too hard to be met, which is a little bit unfortunate, but there have been places that have been patient with us, um, helped understand his needs and yeah, I think I can recall a specific example. We took him to a grocery store and where they have all the DVDs hung up, he took every single Wiggles DVD and put them on the floor. Um, so yeah, so a lot of the time we're just extremely apologetic because we're not sure how other people will react. So we're just very cautious about the environment around us. Um, but luckily that place was really understanding and really helped my brother Chris um, kind of fit into that community a bit better. They didn't have any negative or, um, yeah, like negative things to say. They were just were really helpful people and they're really understanding and patient towards my family and my brother, yeah. Serene, can you tell us a bit more about um, the programs that you have going at Gymnastics Victoria yeah. and how you're really trying to embrace disability inclusion within your organisation? Yeah. So I am the recreational program coordinator at Gymnastics Victoria and a lot of what I do comes from my personal experience with my brother so I know how important it is to give these people opportunities to have the same benefits in the community. So for example um, we run our Special Olympic competitions uh, and we've begun to run this within our uh, mainstream competitions that we have so they're embedded with all of the other athletes they have the same award ceremony the same opening ceremony and it's been really well received by the parents and the athletes and it's something that people really look forward to so that's one of the programs that we have and a lot of what we're doing is now trying to kind of embed it together because inclusion doesn't mean that they have a separate program on their own that they are put in a corner where there are less people and it's more quiet. It's more about including them in the wider community. It's about how we can adjust our current programs and what we have to meet the needs of the people who do have additional needs. So it's about making them feel comfortable in a space that we already have. Yeah. 
Yeah. I think that touches on a really good point there. If I could just go back to you for a second, Dina, with TV access. Like obviously you're running events and uh, that are, you know, specifically at the moment for disability, um, for all, for people to be involved from, you know, that's, that's kind of side of it. But obviously, ideally is the goal for it to just be a part of, you know, a normal or any sort of rock concert in any type of setting where inclusion is just a part and it's rolled out as part of the show. It's not a separate thing. Yeah, and yeah. that's exactly what we did with Groove Tunes. We made yeah. a festival that wasn't a disability specific yeah. festival. It was just a festival yeah. that had Auslan interpreters, that had a lowered bar, that had things that should be in everyday practices yeah. for the music and arts industry. Yeah. Um, it's about um, you know embedding everything together mm. and, and being included uh, for our community to be included in mainstream things, everyday things. Just yeah. We need a little bit of extra extra help. That's all it is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And promoting it in the same way, in the same Correct. avenues, yes. just so it can attract everyone from yeah. the community, regardless of mm -hmm. your ability. Yeah, awesome. And question for you, Storm: What do you think um, are the key barriers to disability inclusion in your well, experience? Well, the key barriers, man. It's like a large group of frameworks where. There's a lot of issues behind just the inclusion. It's the mobility. It's the a access to the actual events. Mm. It's the feeling that they actually want you to be there and you actually want to be a part of that experience. Yeah. I think a lot of the times when people with disabilities, when they grow up, they don't feel like it's, they don't feel like it's a part of the experience. And I think a lot of the times we are robbed of that happy experience um i remember a couple of times i used to always want to go to the gold coast and do all those theme parks and we did but i just didn't feel like it was a disability friendly experience. Mm. it came with barriers yeah it came with um some sort of like question marks of how do i get to this area and how do i get to that area so we were more worried about that than actually enjoying the actual theme mm. park itself. Mm. And that's the problem with disability inclusion and the development of that framework is slowly building, but it's not to the point where I can say, yes, I want to go to the Gold Coast again because they've got disability friendly rides. Yeah. They've got disability friendly um, access or support workers there to make your experience more comfortable mm -hmm. and relaxing. Because at the end of the day, when you go into that once in a lifetime experience, no matter what it is, you want it to be a good memory, mm -hmm. not something that you're struggling, not something that you're having to deal with because you weren't expecting this and this and this. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's part of the issue. And I guess what needs to happen is there needs to be like a sort of like a video of what, 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 what would actually happen if you're actually at that place beforehand. So yeah. before you go there, yep. you can actually see in mm. detail of what you could actually experience at that venue yep. rather than just rock up and just deal with the problems. You've got to pre-plan everything. Yeah, absolutely. So Which takes away from your whole experience it does, because it you're not does. enjoying it. It does. Yep. But also think too, it's about being a part of that um, team, being a part of the process as well so if you leave good feedback about your disability experience and that's why they can improve on what they're um, achieving mm -hmm. because I do think that they want to include people with disabilities but they don't know how to do it yep. and it's up to us to give them the feedback on how to do it yeah because who better to know us than people who have lived with um, our experiences yeah to exactly. know that feedback. Exactly. And you're on a mission to change people's attitudes and perceptions towards people with disability. Can you talk to us a little bit more about what you're doing actively? Yeah, because when I was about very, very young age, I was um, bullied a lot at school because I stood out because of my uh, K-frame or, or walker, as they call it these days. And I just wanted to show them who I am as a person rather than the disability. I didn't want the disability to be a hindrance. I wanted it to be a motivator for people rather than a negative. Mm. Yeah. So in order to change people's perceptions of, of you, you have to change yourself. So I became more open, more friendly. 
more storm-like rather than this negative, um, not happy type person because often or not people fear what they don't know. Mm -hmm. So when you break down that barrier, you are, you're able to help people open up to what they think that people with disabilities are actually like. Because unfortunately, when you've got media people that are portraying us in a certain way, that's mm -hmm. what they think that's what we're like, but we're not actually yeah. like that. Yeah. So it was to change perceptions of people's reality of what a disability is. Mm. And it took a long, long time to do that. Um, so one of the things I did was, I like wheelchair soccer. So I thought, what better way for them to experience of what a disability is actually like, putting an able-bodied team and a disability team together, and that way they don't, they're not scared of, oh, I wonder what this person's like. It was they were open up during the game and talk like an everyday person to each other. So it was really, really good. Um, there weren't that many people with disabilities, but th there's enough group there at that time to experience what it was actually like for, for the able-bodied people, and it was able to break the ice, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Anybody else on the panel got anything to contribute to that in terms of, you know, there's a lot of themes coming through here around sort of change, obviously, is needed. We need to continually push for change, but education as well. Education across, um, you know, our entire world about what it's like to, to, to live with disability and also as a world, how we can be more inclusive and encouraging that across, you know, social settings, um, employment settings and just in our daily lives. Uh, for my experience when I was young, I have Down syndrome, which means a uh, learning disability. I got picked on a lot at school um, as well um, and looked at and got teased and bullied. And, and one of them um, just point at you or laugh at you or make fun of you. I don't like that sort of thing. I don't like to be bullied like that. Yep. Um, but I try not to um, want people to think that I've got disability just because that, because um, some people with disabilities don't have, um, don't want to feel like they want to be mean or being rude or being get picked on. They just want to be normal human beings. Like people with, who, like us, want to be human beings. Don't want to be treated like a disability. You know, like other people do, like in a path or 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 in the um, direction they're heading. So I think it's important not to be be bullied for their own disabilities, mm, you know? Yeah, yeah. I'm interested, anyone on the panel had an experience where, you know, they've sort of been in, in a setting where it's been done exceptionally well and they felt like, you know, they, they went into that environment and it was very accepting, you know, there were all the accessibility requirements and everything was there. Like, what's been a, a really great experience if you've had one? For me, it was the Worry Zoo because I recently okay. just went there after yep. 10 years. Yeah. It was friendly. Yeah. They had all the accessibility for the safari. Nice. So again, it was making the experience more enjoyable rather than worrying about my disability. Yeah. So to me, I got to see all the animals. I wasn't restricted in what I could, couldn't, couldn't see. Yeah. Um. The they they had everything all set up. So when you're onto the safari, you don't feel like you're gonna fall off the wheelchair. Um. Because they got some of those hooks into the wheelchair. Yep. So they're able to just, you know, sit there and watch the animals without any worry about that. Great. They got yep. um, disability ramp back access. So yep. when you need to go off, they got like this sort of like um, elevator. Mm -hmm. You know, in the maxi taxis, they yep. have those elevators. So they put you in a wheelchair and you get unstrapped and then they put you down nice and safely. Mm -hmm. So coming in and out of it was fantastic. Amazing. Because one of my big concerns is, is steps and... Yep. Because I've got cerebral palsy, it is very, very difficult for me to put my leg up on the step, no matter how high it is, for me to put the weight and transfer it onto the next leg mm. because you're worrying about falling over. Yep. 
So yeah. that's something you've got to learn in training, but in real life experience, you're just worrying about trying to not embarrass yourself yeah, in public. Yeah, and exactly. And how fantastic that you could just rock up and enjoy that experience. Yes, it wasn't yes. like you had to work out exactly how you needed to, you know, enjoy something. You could just get there and, and, yeah. li and live Wh it. Which is why I said before, and people need to pre-plan yeah. their trips. Yeah. They need to investigate what yeah. the senior is like, and they need to, you know, look at reviews, yep. look at other people's experiences, mm. but also give them feedback so the next time you won't have that same exactly. experience. Exactly. So the organisation can improve that yes. experience. Yes. And like you said, great thing about having a video on a website and just yes. informing people and just again going back to that education. People think, when they think about accessibility, when organisations think about accessibility, they freak out because mm. they're like, oh yep. my goodness, this is going to cost me so much money. I need mm. to change the entire build of, of my experience or whatever it is. But what it comes down to is there are, there are a lot of quick wins out there, mm -hmm. right? So um, Storm has already touched on it, but like, you know, adding things to your website because whether you have a visible or non-visible disability, yeah. we have to plan, we have to pre-plan, whether it's going to a cafe, whether it's going to Werribee Zoo, whether it's coming to a space like this to do, you know, this panel, we need to pre-plan, we need to know, is there parking? Is there going to be a sensory space available, an accessible bathroom? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Mm -hmm. Those things are quick and easy wins. Mm -hmm. You know, providing all of that information on your website is a step closer to being more inclusive and more accessible. Yeah. As a business, you set a budget every year, right? Mm -hmm. So it's about planning of okay, this year I can update my website. I can take you know disability inclusion training and and up skill my customer service team to ensure that we are accessible but then you know this year we can install a ramp next year we can yeah. upgrade our accessible toilets and there are government grants out there that are willing to support that and mm. help that it's just about educating yourself yeah. and finding that information to yeah. do that uh, i have cerebral palsy as well and the thing about it, the accessibility is i'm sure you know so often you'll call in advance and explain your situation to be like do you have access? Is it accessible? You get there and then it turns out it does have a staircase or, you know, if you want to use a disabled toilet, it's next door. Um, how can we create better accountability on venue owners uh, related to this issue? I think that they need to show video evidence so you can actually see it for yourself. I don't, I don't believe in word of mouth and I, and I believe in a sort of like an app where you have people who are able-bodied go into the venue beforehand and act like a disability person. <laughs> so that's so so that's what I'll be doing. Yeah. I've been really pushing for an app where you can download on the Play Store, where you have disability carers go into venues such as like Melbourne Zoo, such as like Werribee Zoo or any other like popular place, MCG or stuff like that, where, you know, it's common practice that we all go to these venues, but we mm. don't really know what it's like for people with disabilities. Yeah. So we need to have someone on the inside to tell us, okay, this is what we need because this is gonna benefit person A, person B, and so on and so on. So we need to have an investigator to investigate for us before we get there because what you don't want is, again, you don't want to have that experience robbed of you uh, of the time that you want to be there. You want to have a good experience. Mm. So I would much rather have someone that can work for the NDIS to say, okay, Brian might have a problem with going up the stairs. We, 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 we've seen this problem happen a couple of times as I've written a couple of reviews about it. Nothing has been done. Can we you know, address this issue so future people don't have to deal with that sort of problem. So when you get there, you better do what you want to do rather than worrying about obstacles that are in your way. I, I really like that because I like the whole word of mouth thing. Like the only word of mouth mm. I would trust is like another person with a disability. The other question I was going to ask, as you mentioned media portrayals and not liking the representation, give me some examples of how you think it's problematic and where you think it could be better. Well, I don't think there's enough media reputation, rep, uh, representation, sorry, in the general mainstream. Like the only media person that I know is Dylan Orcott, who's a very, very famous tennis player. And I love my sports, 
but I don't know much about disability sports because it's mm. not really talked about apart from the Olympic Games or the pro or the or the Commonwealth Games. We just don't see it. And because we don't see it, we don't have role models and we don't have people that we can look up to mm. for those type of things. We don't have people in like um, other settings that are crucial. Like we're just starting now with, with uh, governments. Governments just barely got enough disability <laughs> people to talk on our behalf, but that's only just started. We're gonna be talking about workplaces. We're gonna be talking about um, employment. All these people who are advocating for us need to get a bigger profile. So they need to create um, like, I don't know, maybe start up a YouTube channel where they can create that profile mm -hmm. because there's not enough um, media outlets that are willing to help people with disabilities get started on creating a famous face or creating a famous um, program where they can just tune in and, and go, okay, th this is um, Dylan Alcott, I know who this is, but you need to be able to build that over time. You need to be able to get the public's support as well. But there's none of that. Yeah. Because unfortunately, we're a group that, do, that want to be talked about, but don't really want to be the center of attention. Mm -hmm. It happened again mm -hmm. in, in, the, in, the, in the election, yep. where we had the NDIS and it wasn't really talked about until towards the end. Mm -hmm. We weren't talked about during the pandemic that much. We were left on our own devices yep. because there was no spokesman to come and talk to us yeah. or, or talk on our behalf. And I'm sure the panelists here would agree with me that there wasn't enough inclusion yeah. when it yeah. came to supporting people with disabilities during a pandemic or during a big event. Yeah. Because yeah. I only had one knock on the door during the whole pandemic mm -hmm. and it was really, really bad. Um, I understand everyone was going through that bad time and everyone was you know, having a hard time, but for the disability community, it was shocking. It was horrible. Our mental health, our well-being, mm -hmm. Uh, the way that we were looked on and it was just a horrible experience. So hopefully we give them feedback and it doesn't happen again, but yep. you know, it's one of those things. Yeah. And it's interesting to touch on that point as well. I think with, like you said, obviously Dylan Alcott's got an amazing profile. He's done incredible things in the space, but we're talking about one person really, who's kind of, I guess, you know, a bit of the poster boy a lot of the time. Um, is a representation of disability and it's about getting more people out there and creating more people that have a public profile and a platform um, that they can also, you know, help spread the word and help create that education awareness through the entire community, um, not just in sort of sport and entertainment sectors, but across the board, workplaces, um, social, everything. Yeah. You're talking about Dylan. I know Dylan quite well. I knew him before he was a tennis player. He was Australian basketballer as well, you're probably aware of that. And how I got involved with him as a friend of mine from New South Wales, was in the Australian wheelchair basketball team. I was in Perth at the time, and whenever they played a game in Perth, he would contact me and say, hey, we're coming over. And you were talking about people going and, and scrutinising places that are disability friendly before you go there. I was the guy that used to have to go and check out the hotels and the restaurants that they were gonna stay at and eat at because a lot of places advertised as wheelchair friendly or disability friendly and really all they had was a ramp. So mm -hmm. yes, the boys could get up the ramp, but when they get in the hotel room, the for example, the, the, the door to the bathroom or the toilet was only this wide. So some of the fellas could get out of their chairs and walk, but those that were restricted to the chair they go to go to the toilet and the wheelchair won't fit through the toilet door. Oh, and you'll say to the, you know, mm. what are they supposed to do? You know, get get an extension straw, you know. <laughs> um, so they were the problems that I came about and I learned a lot from the basketball guys because they're mm. quite open about their disabilities and their needs and requirements. And so I went and scouted premises and pointed out to a lot of these hotels, motels, self-contained units that you're advertising as disability friendly and, and you're not really, you need wider doors, you need you need this and you, and you need that. Also, just to touch on when you were saying that you were wheelchair soccer and, and you got some able-bodied people to try and play, I had the fortunate position of being able to train the basketball guys. Fantastic. And after two minutes, 
I was buggered. You know, I, I couldn't do it. I had blisters and I had, you know, I packed it in. And so I really gained admiration for, for all disability people. I'm now a disability support worker, but this was, was well before that. So I think you've got an ideal opportunity now. Although Dylan's only one person, he is Australian of the Year. So it's a better platform to get knowledge out there than, than probably ever has. Yeah. And maybe I'd like to see Dylan get, get his basketball mates or his other, you know, disability tennis mates to to spread the word and, more, and as you say, more than just one face, have 20 faces, yeah. have use, exactly. use, use those platforms mm. to, to full advantage. So that's just what I wanted to say to you, Storm. My, my, and my other point, and sorry, love, I've forgotten your name. Uh, Kes. 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 Sorry, love. Yeah, you. Um, I don't know whether whether you remember this or not, but a, a few years ago, um, Michelle Payne won the Melbourne Cup, and her brother Stevie has Down syndrome, mm -hmm. and he was he was the scrapper. I happened to be in a pub watching the Melbourne Cup, and of course, you know Stevie come on the screen, and I had some person next to me sort of say, well. Why are they letting that person look after that horse, you know? And I'm trying to explain to him that just because someone looks different doesn't mean that they, they've lost all abilities, you know? Stevie's one of 10 children, brought, you know, and the parents were horse trainers. He would have been brought up around horses. He is quite capable of handling a horse, and he proved that. But I think that was a great thing as far as making awareness or at least people asking the question, you know, when, when he came on the screen and people could see that he had Down syndrome, but he was doing a job and he was doing a bloody good job and he had a sense of humour and he was great and they've since made a movie about it. Do you think that that has improved awareness about Down syndrome or you, or you don't know? Or Well, I think that's really good experience for Stevie because I am friends with Stevie. Are you? Yes, I am. <laughs> I, well, you know how cheeky he is. <laughs> I do, I do. I know how cheeky he is. Um, I used to do Special Olympics with him, um, and he does some of um, Special Olympics with me as well. Um, but um, my uh, friend, Denise Collins, she... Um, helps Davy um, a lot um, with things um, like that sort of thing. But I think that he was helping my brother, Alan, um, was, because uh, my brother, Alan, he's an actor. So he did um, a, a show with Davy Payne, so with, called Riding Like a Girl. And um, I reckon that's an amazing show. I think he did a really good job looking after horses in the show. I don't know how he can do it in, that, in, in, in his disability, but he did it. He did it. He did it really well. Um, he, he, he can't do it any more better than that. He, he's really good. He's, um, I reckon that's the kind of a job that other people should get like like that, like looking after pets, look after horses, look after dogs, look after cats, you know. But it's important to know what kind of pet they wanted to look after. Like horses, for example, um, they need to look after the horses to make sure that they're all brushed down, to make sure that they are healthy and make sure that run healthy. But yeah, I reckon he's doing amazingly well for his, for his disability. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, yeah, definitely having somebody like Stevie Payne um, prominent in the media after, yeah, Michelle won the Melbourne Cup has definitely helped to elevate and, and get the word out and the message across to people about inclusion. And, you know, he's doing his job, you know, that's his job. Um, and yeah, it was a, was a fantastic, fantastic that he got to have that platform, definitely. But yeah, I think we all agree, more people. It's not just about sort of a couple of people that we have um, prominent. It needs to be sort of a message that we're, that is represented across all, all areas. 
um, of you know education, sport, life, everything that that everything that we all encounter. Yep, definitely. Yes, another question. Two parts. The first one is: Can you guys start a business where you review sites or places, the venues to visit? <laughs> musical events and employers to that help people with this. So when we start that business, because I think you guys have all lived experiences that would be really advantageous for everyone else mm. to hear and see. The one thing is just to capture on something you said with growing up, putting able-bodied people in a wheelchair and go have a go. How do we, we know education, we've mentioned it you know, multiple times, how do we educate younger so people understand it earlier? What mm. do you think we could do? I think it starts from kindergarten i think it starts from exposing um disability like activities for example getting a person who's able-bodied to read about a disability story and getting them exposed into a positive light not in a negative light mm -hmm. i know there's a lot of people in the disability community that's probably going to disagree they're probably going to say no 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 we we, we, we don't want to be shown on tv but in fact you actually want to because that way it takes that stigma away mm. if you take that stigma away people will be more open and more friendly because they'll, they'll know you as a person rather than the disability see the person not the disability so the more they see it on tv the more it becomes a normal habit of life yeah just mm -hmm. think about it for one second if i saw something that was unnatural to me the first instinct i'm going to think of i'm scared i'm terrified so what do we do as human beings when we see that something's a bit not right? We, we get scared. We, mm -hmm. we, 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 shield our, we shield ourselves mm -hmm. and we become negative. And that, that, that negativity is protecting us because we don't want to be exposed because we don't understand. And like I said, we, don't, we fear what we don't understand. Mm -hmm. So once we do understand, that cycle of that negativity goes away. Yeah. Because we begin to accept that these people are just everyday people trying to trying to mm. fit in a world that's not really yeah. a part of what we signed up for. Yep. We didn't sign up for a disability, it just happened. It's like a deck of cards. You get dealt with a bad hand and then you've got to make the most of the bad hand you've got. But what makes it easier for us is to making that hand a bit more easier. So mm -hmm. if we're able to create better situations where we don't have to worry about certain things because our disability is more worrying more than more than it is. With our conditions, with our everyday life and what we yeah. have to deal with, it's in a much better situation because we can focus on the things that matter rather mm -hmm. than the things that we don't have control of. Yeah. Because we don't have control of society. But what we, what we can do is we can create a platform where we can control the way we want to live, the way we want to express ourselves. Mm, mm. And that is through television. Mm. And starting those conversations and that education really early. Yep. Like you said, kindergarten, yep. television, all the social platforms that we have. Yeah, people seeing it represented and then understanding this is life. Yeah. Yeah, that's like me, you know, like yep. I'm a bit like that too. Um, I, um, I don't think that um, other people understand, like, like older people don't understand that, um, that what it's like for people with Down syndrome, where people were, were born with Down syndrome and they don't realise that um, when they're born Down syndrome, they don't want to feel like to be treated like Down syndrome, mm. you know, because it's, it's a, it's a one disability, you know, yeah. um, that you created. It's not something that I expected to happen, but it did happen. Mm -hmm. But it's important to experience um, for people with Down syndrome to be connected to other people, to be friends with, you know, mm -hmm. um, not to just um, telling people to shush or, or, or telling people to be quiet or or, yeah. or to be walked away from, you know, because it's not, we're not like that. We're not, we're not like sitting back um, and say, oh, let's wait for our turn or, or, or anything like that. 
people with Down syndrome have to be, like all, all the people with disability have to be um, raising our voice, sharing our voice, and and also ex um, to show the world what we can do better than other people can. Like other people can do things better than than us because we've got that experience in ourselves, mm. but we've got to share that experience for anybody else who wants one. Just a, a couple of points. Um, I, I was born with spina bifida and I recently went away um, with a friend who also has spina bifida. She's a wheelchair user, I'm not. Um, and the way that we get treated by people um, is often very different because mine is more invisible, hers is more visible. Um, and don't talk to me about accessible rooms because, yeah, that's a whole nother issue that we've already <laughs> covered. Um, the idea of, um, you know, Dylan Alcott, Alcott, sorry, and others having, you know, more of a, a higher profile um, and utilising it as a good idea. However, mm -hmm. you know, what, what has been done here today is just as important and what you were saying that, you know, for those of us who are confident enough within our disability to be voices, it starts at the grassroots. Yep. Um, for example, someone mentioned a YouTube channel. I've just started my YouTube channel, my own website. So, you know, if we could all get our voices out there. Um, the other thing is that it also needs to start from the top. Does anyone know if any health minister has ever disclosed that they have a disability? Do Have we ever had a health minister who's disclosed that? It'd be really nice for a health minister mm. to have lived experience yeah. in some way, shape or form mm -hmm. um, so that processes and procedures and policies are not just dictated to us, but they actually have a hands-on experience um, and you can have as many advisory boards as you want, but advisory boards are not always dominated by people's lived experience. Mm. Um, so, you know, we need to step up from the grassroots, but, you know, from the top down need to step um, in line too and be really nice to have a health minister at some point, doesn't matter what party, um, reflecting that as well. Um, but, you know, today I think this conversation has been brilliant and I think it's a great start for advocacy um, and hopefully even for lobbying higher up in the future. So thank you for today, really yeah. got a lot out of it. Thank you, I think that's a, an incredible point there. You know, it does start with conversations like we're having today and, and panels and, you know, giving you guys a voice and an opportunity to talk about your experiences. And, you know, we all get educated, we all leave the conversation a lot richer than when we came to it, just knowing what you've experienced and knowing what contribution that we can make as individuals and also as an organisation to create, um, you know, the ultimate change in our community, which is what we're here to do and why we exist. So it's a um, really, really important point. Absolutely. Is there another yeah, oh, question? Good. Yeah. yeah. One bit of advice, insight from your lived experiences around business owners or people that might influence business owners that will watch this. What is that? You've made some really cool points already around, you know, to start with the, the easy wins, right? But what advice can you give them? Like simple advice while they're thinking about building an environment, building a culture where accessibility and inclusivity is more part of their business model and their workplace. Yeah. Um, well, I think there are already like such great organizations doing such great things in the accessibility and inclusion space. So I would say learning from people who have already done their research, who already have experience with people with lived disabilities. It's really learning from them, seeing what they do well, and then adapting on that and seeing how it can fit into your organization. So I think, yeah, a lot of stuff, amazing stuff is out there and already growing so I think already learning from what's out there and then adapting it to suit your business or your organization is really important yeah definitely any other tips I guess Dina from you just given your organization and the way that you've gone about things yeah I think again it starts with the, that educating yourself reaching out to access consultancies and saying hey this is what we want to do can you provide us with you know, immersive experiences, can you provide us with training, workshops, panels, whatever people provide is going to help 
educate the organisation and the business to upskill and to learn more. Um, and then again, like starting with those quick and easy wins, doing your own research to say, well, I can do this on my own and it's not going to cost yeah. me anything. You know, things like obviously social media is such a massive part, advertising and, and um, you know, people learning about different things that people often don't put alt text in their in their you know posts mm. um so they're you know missing out on the blind and low vision community that need that um things like posting videos without captions you're then excluding a, the deaf and hard of hearing community it's again those small and quick wins that will make you step your way up into being a more inclusive and accessible business and that's a wrap for our first episode. Thank you so much to our amazing panel of guests, Dina, Kez, Serene and Storm. And thank you to our amazing audience. I look forward to hosting more episodes in the future and thank you for watching.